get into the podcast. <laughs> All, right. All right. All right, guys. Welcome back to the JPS podcast. This is episode 25 with physique coach, pro bodybuilder, Cliff Wilson. So for those of you who don't know who Cliff is, he's a professional natural bodybuilder, one of the top physique coaches in the industry with over 90 pro cards under his name, 92 to be precise. So he's nearing 100 now and over 50 pro titles, as well as world champions to boot. So Cliff is one of the best physique coaches uh, to date, and I'm really honored to have him on the show today. So welcome, Cliff. Oh, I appreciate you having me on. It's an honor, and thank you for that very generous uh, <laughs> intro. <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it. Cliff is also way too modest, guys. So, <laughs> And... Cliff wants results for his clients and has proven time and time again why he is one of the leading physique coaches um, because he pushes the boundaries and every single one of his clients comes to the stage in amazing condition. They hold a lot of muscle and they just look absolutely amazing on stage. So we're going to be talking today about contest prep, some of the nuances and things that uh, Cliff does with his clients and then we're going to talk about a little bit of the off-season uh, and how Cliff approaches that personally, as well as with his clients. So obviously, Cliff, you have so much experience and knowledge in the physique game, um, and we'll get all into all the nitty-gritty of contest prep soon, um, but can you outline to the listeners how you got into this whole lifting thing, and what has driven you to excel as a bodybuilder? Yeah, sure. You know, so, um, you know, when I first started lifting, uh, I was a, in college, I was playing basketball, and uh, it was a Division One school, so a lot of times they get everyone together and they do body fat testing and weightlifting. And uh, you know, since it was a Division One school, a lot of these uh, a lot of these guys were pretty gifted athletes. Um, even if they weren't focusing on muscle mass, you know, particularly, they were they were reading off everybody's stats. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them were, you know, six foot two plus all the way to seven feet. But a lot of them were, you know, they're reading off all the names and. So and so, you know, 200 pounds, 9% body fat, you know, 220 pounds, you know, 8% body fat. And they're going down the line. They get to me and they go, Cliff Wilson, uh, six foot one, 156, 14.5% body fat. So yeah. I was like skinny fat, you know, compared to all these guys. And one yeah. of the senior, one of the, one of the one of the seniors looks over at me and just goes, "Damn." <laughs> so, so um, that was when I was like, "Okay, I've got to I've got to change this." Yeah. And so I kind of just started lifting weights, and I got into it. I would say within a month of picking up a weight, I knew I wanted to compete. Um, I think we all know that feeling where you know people that are meant for this sport. We all know that feeling where you pick it up and it just feels so natural. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I went about my lifting, I, I, I went about my lifting, um, it took me a while before I got on stage, I was lifting for about five years before I actually competed. Um, anyone who, who followed me for a while knows that I don't necessarily have the greatest genetics for this sport. Um, you know, that's not, a, that's not anything to be self-deprecating, it's just a, an honest assessment. And, um, you know, to this day, I actually think it turned out to be a very good thing for me, um, because it forced me to look for better ways of doing things. In the early parts of my career, I was just doing what most of the popular bodybuilders were doing, and my results were not very good. And so, um, you know, it forced me to really analyze the way I did every little thing. I, I think if I were progressing at a rate that I was happy with in the early stages of my career, I wouldn't have looked to do things differently because I would have been happy and content to keep progressing as is. Um, so, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting. My my struggles over the course of my career personally, I think made me a better coach in the long run. Um, so, you know, I did my first show in 2008. I did okay. took second in the novice division. And then um, shortly after that, I had some people approach me from my local gym. They wanted to do a show and I didn't know if I was quite ready to start coaching, but I knew that I knew more than them. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I could, I could offer some advice and help get them the stage. And, you know, they did really, really well to start. And then when they did really well, I had other people approach me. And then, then when they did really well, it just kind of kept snowballing. There wasn't a, you know, there wasn't a lot of social media. There was no social media marketing then, and I didn't do anything in particular, but just, um, just results. It was just results based. 
Yeah. And that's usually, uh, yeah, the best way as a coach to build a client base is, you know, it's not how well you can market, it's how well you can coach. And if you could, you know, outline your coaching philosophy, you know, obviously that could take an entire podcast in and of itself. But, you know, in a couple of sentences, what would be the, you know, core tenets of, you know, what you believe in? Obviously results being, you know, one of them. Yeah, you know, I, I do focus heavily on on. Well, and I would say that even when I, when I say focusing on results, but it's actually more focusing on a process and then results take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. But I know that, you know, with, with the people that I work with, with the clients that I work with, from day one, um, I've stressed that we aren't going to settle for anything less than your absolute best. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and, and I know that there are some coaches and some competitors, they just want to get up there and have fun. Um, and, you know, it's all about just the experience of getting up on stage. And um, but for me, I want competitors that want to absolutely leave no, no stone unturned. Uh, you know, that, to me, that's very important. Mm -hmm. I, I always say um, I would rather have a client take fifth place and reach their absolute best than to win and know they could have been better. Yeah. And so that's um, that's really important to me. And as far as the strategies that I use, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into that. But, you know, I start with um, uh, a base of what is proven scientifically. I, I like to, you know, I've, science can tell us an awful lot about the sport and about our bodies and the way to progress. Um, but I also do not ignore what I see happening in real life. Mm -hmm. um, when I see something that happening that seems to either conflict with the scientific evidence or is maybe not yet proven by the scientific evidence, then I start to look for reasons why that may be. And um, I'm not afraid to use something that maybe isn't proven scientifically if I see it working in real life. Um, and then, sure. you know, I just kind of go from there. I, I try to blend the two together as best I can and then give a rational explanation for why yeah. I'm doing it. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's uh, yeah, sign of a good coach, somebody who pays attention to the science but doesn't ignore you know what's happening in real time. And obviously, you work with a lot of high-level athletes, you know, many of who are seasoned bodybuilders. But for somebody who's just wanting to start out, when is the right time to compete? And you know, in some cases, do you advise against competing? And when would that be? Yeah, you know, there are a few things. I would say a lot of the um, prerequisites for whether or not you're ready to compete are mental. Um, you know, the, because technically anybody can get on stage at any point. Uh, but the question is, are you mentally ready to embark on the process that will it will require to get the stage, which anybody who's ever done it knows that it is it can be brutal. Um, so, you know, you need to want to, one, make sure you are ready for that process of getting on stage. Um, and then two, you need to make sure you are mentally ready to handle whatever takes place on that stage. Mm. Uh, when I see somebody getting ready for their first show and they're all like talking about win or go home or it's going to, you know, I'm coming for first place. Um, they're usually <laughs> setting themselves up for a hard fall when they don't win, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, you know. I, I hate the saying failure is not an option because uh, you're, you're probably going to fail a lot on the, on the road to success. Mm -hmm. And if you fall into a freaking depression every time you fail, you're never going to live to see success. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so uh, I, I think so. Th I think those are the biggest things, you know, being able to um, mentally uh, handle everything that comes with it. And then from the physical side, I think you just need to be realistic about where you stand physically. You know, I, I wanted to compete after two years of training, but I knew I didn't have the muscle mass to place or at least look the way I knew I wanted to look um, for my first time getting on mm. stage. And so, you know, that's that's a big thing is um, you can technically get up there whenever you want, but are you gonna look the way you want to look? And then that's the question you need to ask yourself. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of all, all encompassing once again, back to the mental aspect yeah. of are you ready to handle what takes place on that stage? Awesome, awesome. And in terms of structuring a contest prep, you prefer, you know, obviously the more time we have, the more able we are to lose fat first and foremost, which means we're going to get leaner, we're going to retain more muscle, we essentially have more, you know, tools in our toolbox in terms of sustainability, diet breaks, refeeds, all those kind of things. 
And obviously the industry is like a pendulum. We swing back and forth from extremes and, you know, back in the early 2000s, the contest prep was like 12 weeks. You'd do your 12-week yeah. diet, you'd sprint to the finish line and you'd be exhausted when you got there and then you'd gain back all your fat. And we've obviously now this big shift towards the opposite where it's like, you know, 30-week preps, you know, nine-month preps and all this kind of stuff. Um, but besides the obvious benefits of a slower approach to, you know, a contest prep, are there times where, you know, you would advise a shorter prep and, you know, are there drawbacks and are people getting too hung up on, you know, doing a longer prep and are there, you know, costs to that? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, first off, I will say that while my clientele is largely natural, I do work with a few clients every year that are non-natural athletes. Obviously, obviously, they don't do natural shows. Um, that's my that's my primary stipulation of working with them. Um, and so, but uh, for those that aren't natural, you can lose fat uh, more quickly, and because of what they're taking, they won't sacrifice muscle tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, there, there's still a limit to how fast you should can slash should go. Uh, but so if somebody isn't natural, I will push pace quite a bit more, and you can reduce that diet time. Um, which is actually a big perk of not being natural. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another situation is you, you are correct. That I think people have started to romanticize the long diet. Mm-hmm. Now, you're talking to somebody who when I did my last show, I dieted for like 46 <laughs> weeks. Um, but but uh, I would say that that comes from just the rate of loss that I needed to maintain mm. To, to know that I will maintain all the muscle mass that I can. Um, so, you know, I, I, it, it all comes down to how much weight do you need to lose? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if somebody can comfortably hold 18 pounds above show weight, they don't need a 40 week diet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they're probably going to be good with a 22 to 25 week diet or something along those lines. Maybe if they really wanted to push it, maybe 20. Um, so, you know, it's all going to, going to be about how many pounds do you need to lose? And then uh, how many weeks will it take you to lose it at a reasonable rate of loss? Mm. Now, rate of, rate of loss is, you know, how many pounds uh, you're losing per week. Or, you know, I know uh, from where you're at, a lot of, you know, kilograms, which Kilos. would be about a half kilogram. About a half kilogram kilogram per week. Uh, I always tell my overseas clients, I'm like, the, that's the downside of having a coach in the U.S. I, you send me your weight in pounds. Um, but, but uh, so, you know, usually I would... I would look for maybe a half kilogram per week in that range. Um, but you also need to realize that's not always sustainable because while you can say, yeah, we'll lose roughly a pound or a half kilogram per week, uh, there's going to be weeks where that doesn't happen. You just stall or, you know, you maybe you get sick or something like that. Mm. So then you are set back a week. So you kind of need to build in buffer weeks. Um, but, you know, for, for the most part, you know, if you allow a, a rate of about a pound per week, uh, maybe for women a little bit less, uh, because women just have a harder time losing fat than men. And then uh, you can kind of follow that pace as mm. you go along, and you'll be about you'll be pretty good. So, but on the flip side, you know, if you have 40 pounds to lose, you can't expect to lose it in 20 weeks. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I yeah. can promise you. Awesome. And um, with your clients, you know, obviously on social media, you know, from what we see. And we hear about all the pro cards and the pro titles and world championships that your clients have. Have there been any times where you've had to pull the pin on the client's contest prep because they haven't been ready because they mentally broke down, you know, for whatever reason it is? Um, and if so, yeah, what were the reasons behind this? And, you know, how do you go about dealing with that? And what's the, you know, plan of attack moving forward from there? Yeah, you know, that is a, wow, that is a great question. Okay, so here's one thing that I will say is, uh, I've been pretty fortunate. I've been really fortunate to work with some high-level athletes, uh, you know, top professionals, world champions. And when I get when I get uh, amateurs or people that are newer to the sport or people that you know are still on the lower tier trying to work their way up, um, when they cheat on their diet, because it happens, <laughs> you know, they cheat on their diet. Uh, and or they miss a cardio session, they say something to me like, I feel, they always say, I feel like I'm probably a failure given how um, how some of your clients are and how successful they are and how they must be. So people get in their head that these top pros 
uh, are just perfect. flawless, yeah. perfect human beings. I can tell you without a doubt, I would say that top pros probably cheat on their diet at a higher rate than they get away with it. The, yeah, it, 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 you know, people don't want to hear this, but gen genetics count for a lot. They really do. Now, I'm not saying all top pros cheat on their diet, but um, I can safely say it occurs at a higher incidence than probably with the average amateur competitor um, because they can get away with it. Um, you know, it's not, and, but once again, it's not like the pros are saying, oh, well, I cheated on my diet. They beat themselves up right. just as badly. And then they compare themselves to other top pros and they say, that guy probably <laughs> never cheats on his diet. Well, they know that guy cheats on his diet yeah. too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, there are always going to be instances. Now there are a lot of people also that just never deviate. Um, you know, but I think it's important to, um, realize that that behavior is not out of the norm. And so my job as a coach is to, one, help people learn to break that pattern of behavior. Mm -hmm. But when it does happen, be realistic about how to recover from it and or find a different show mm -hmm. to make it happen. Um, <clears throat> I will say this when uh, – when, for any reason, whether because you know I'm not I'm not flawless uh, as a coach. There have been times where maybe I've mistimed someone's show, mm -hmm. or you know maybe they've overeaten on their diet. Whether whether it's you know um, something that I've done or something that they've done. Uh, generally, I sit down with them once I realize that we're probably not going to be ready for our target show date. I sit down with them and we talk about picking a different show. Mm -hmm. um, and you know that's uh, that's. You know, never an easy conversation to have. But once again, I don't want somebody up on stage at less than their best. And I know they don't want to be up on stage at less than their best. So, you know, it, for any coaches out there, I will, I would highly recommend um, talking to your clients about picking a different show once you realize they're not going to be up to the standard that yeah. you have set for, for yourself. And and same thing with clients. You know, if you, I, I can promise you, it is never a good feeling being on stage thinking, damn, I should have looked better than mm -hmm. this. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, I will do that now as far as, you know, but once again, you go back to the issue of, you know, cheating on the diet or deviating from the plan. It most certainly does happen because even the, even the best, even the best competitors in the world are still human beings. Um, you know, stress gets to them. They have real lives. They have regular jobs usually. Uh, and, you know, those things can get to you and all it takes is a stressful situation to kind of send you over the edge. Yeah, for sure. It's uh, yeah, it's not an easy conversation at all, and often at times, yeah, putting aside the immediate and short-term goals is necessary to you know get the most out of you know your contest prep, and you know the harsh reality of getting on stage and you know getting so lean is that we need to take nutrition and energy expenditure, cardio to places that haven't gone before in most cases, and there's you know. Again, you know, back to what you said about romanticizing the longer contest prep, you know, athletes have started to romanticize, you know, about coaches who keep their clients' calories extremely high with minimal cardio and like these are good coaches, um, you know, and make, you know, claims that coaches who, who bring their clients' calories down extremely low or have them on, you know, a lot of cardio are bad coaches. And whilst, you know, obviously the goal is to keep, things you know as healthy as possible there are times where we require, require extremely low calories shit ton of cardio all those kind of things so <laughs> yeah. i wanted to hear your thoughts on you know energy intake and energy expenditure you know it varies amongst a lot of people but you know how low have you seen people's calories go um and how much cardio you know just as some context and a bit of discussion about you know these two opposing views that people have yeah, yeah, that's that's a bit, that's a big one. Uh, you know, you're right. There, there did start to this, uh, begin to be this craze where people say things like, "If your coach has you eating less than a cup a day, you know, you need to fire your coach and things like that." And I'm, and I'm like, "Well, man, I would lose an awful lot of clients <laughs> yeah. um, because uh, you know." And, and the big thing is, that you are right. You want to, you want to get somebody in contest condition with as few extreme measures as possible that's that's always a primary goal among you know in contest prep but um the the reality of it is extreme results 
usually are the result of extreme mm. actions. It's just the way it is. You know, if, if 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 people could get absolutely shredded, most people could get absolutely shredded with eating a lot of food and doing minimal cardio, we would see an awful lot more <laughs> shredded people on stage. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the big thing is um, the way now there are mental and physical side effects from pushing to extremes. Mm. And, you know, I, I, anyone who's ever been there will tell you the uh, extreme fatigue, the 24-7 hunger, uh, the hormone fluctuations, um, they are all incredibly mm. difficult to deal with. And I would even say for some people that have never been there before or that are more prone to it, it's almost traumatic. Um, you know, it has, you know, lasting mental effects. Um, so I think that, you know, my job as a coach is to, before we even get there, prepare people for what it will be like mm -hmm. when they get there. And then you also prepare them for what it will be like returning to normalcy after there. Yeah. Um, I, in my opinion, um, that is the way to remain healthy, mm -hmm. uh, mentally and physically, um, while having to go to extremes. Now, the idea that um, top competitors don't go to extremes is just almost the exact opposite. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I've been lucky to also work with some world champions in my time, and I would say that uh, some, a couple of my world champions were probably some of the slowest metabolic rates I've ever worked with. And I've had to push them really hard to get there. One that comes to mind is uh, is the female world bodybuilding champion named Carrie Bolin. Mm -hmm. um, she was a 49 year old female who was five foot one and only weighed 104 pounds on show day. So, yeah, wow. uh, so when you combine her being a female with her age, with her size, that's somebody who's going to have to go to absurdly low caloric intakes just to just to get absolutely shredded. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but. You know, she was able, she was also mentally one of the most steady and strong people I've ever worked with. And so as a result, I was able to push her farther without pushing her over the edge of, mm -hmm. you know, what she could mentally and physically handle. And so, um, you know, I, I, this sounds like a horrible thing to say, and I don't want to scare any young competitors off by saying this, but <laughs> typically, not always, typically, um, the person that was able to get the leanest has a lot to do with them also being the one that could tolerate the most suffering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, it's so true. The shittier you feel, the better you look, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, even in my own experiences, because I'm not immune to those effects. Yeah. Um, you know, when I compete, I can wake up in the morning and without even looking at myself, I can feel if I'm going to be, yeah. leaner that day like you, you, you just know it like mm. you know you're like I feel like garbage today I am probably making a lot of progress right now <laughs> um, it's so, so true so, yeah awesome man and obviously you are renowned for your peaking methods and you know how you go about that so for those listeners who may not be aware of, you know, what a peak is, what, you know, to do, what not to do, and the real basics of it, um, can you outline some of the do's and don'ts when devising a peaking protocol? Peaking, for those of you who aren't sure, guys, is just a, you know, seven-day period prior to the contest where we manipulate, you know, carbohydrates, water, things like that to, you know, bring life to the physique and make it, you know, look its best on stage. So do you want to give the guys a quick rundown as to how you go about things, Cliff? Yeah, yeah. So you're right. The peak week is the final week, and that's something that people um, people are really enamored with the peak week. I love it um, because <laughs> yeah, because that is that is uh, I, I do so I do a lot of things that are probably against the grain even to this day, but people come around with it. But peaking that's one that I know really when I first started coaching rub people the wrong way, like especially even in the more scientific minded coaches, mm. because what I was doing wasn't really. There was a um, scientific hypothesis behind it, but there was no proven that people were saying, you can't, you can't do that. It doesn't work. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm doing it. <laughs> and so, yeah. um, so, you know, I'm going to start off by saying uh, um, you can't peak unless you are 
absolutely 100% shredded lean enough. Uh, up, you won't be able to peak peak away a shitty a shitty diet. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Um, but what I do with my bodybuilders, I don't do this for figure competitors or bikini athletes um, because it, you know they don't require that extreme look. But for bodybuilders, um, I typically use a method called a rapid backload peak, where I will deplete for a certain number of days, usually four to five days, um, to empty out their uh, glycogen stores and create you know, a situation where there'll be a super compensation effect. Um, during the deplete, I'll keep water really high, maybe anywhere in the range of two to three gallons. Um, and I'll raise up proteins and fats. It's more of a carbohydrate deplete than a calorie deplete. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I'll keep sodium pretty high as well. And then, uh, and then on the day before the show, I will usually have for the male competitors, they'll, they'll usually take in anywhere from, uh, let's say 800 on the very low end. Um, up to maybe 13 or 1400 grams of carbohydrates uh, the day before, before the show, along with usually about two and a half to three gallons of water and maybe anywhere from five to 10,000 milligrams of sodium. Um, and so that freaks a lot of people out. Yeah. Um, but it's it's been a very reliable peaking method for me that does you know lead to very good results. Mm -hmm. And so um you know it's. It's something that um, I, I'm pretty passionate about different peaking methods, not just the rapid back loop, because I do use other methods. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's my primary peak for bodybuilders, but I do use other methods like slow or building throughout the week. Um, but uh, I love the peaking process in general just because it's very interesting to me how you can manipulate all the factors to give you that slight bit of edge at the end. And, you know, I know that a lot of people will also say, you know, if you look good, don't change anything. Um, but I'm, once again, I'm really big on not leaving any stone unturned. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I changed, I changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> I changed it all. Um, but I'm now, I'm going to, once again, put another disclaimer. If you aren't absolutely sure about what you are changing, um, I would not recommend changing it mm -hmm. because there is a lot of, uh, Physio physiology at play here as well as experience so um the potential is there for everything to go terribly wrong if you aren't 100 percent sure of the moves you're making so i just want to put that disclaimer in there i would yeah. highly suggest practicing practicing peaking methods before show day comes uh because otherwise you could end up have, could end up dieting for months for nothing exactly right it's yeah, risk to reward and you need to understand the risk and often taking a big risk if you don't understand it and know how it's, you know, could potentially play out, you know, you might not see the reward. And something I wanted to ask you was when you determine the carbohydrate intake for these like massive monster high days, you know, day out from a show, obviously you practice this kind of method with your clients prior to doing so in most cases and that will give you a gauge. But is there a per kg amount that you use to quantify the refit? You know, there isn't, uh, and that's the, that's the hard part. Um, now, I'll, I will say this. Uh, these days, well, I don't, I don't typically practice the peak mm -hmm. before show day um, just because I uh, – unless I have some concern that it's not the right peak right. for that person, um, then I will practice it with them. Um, but I've done it so many times over the years that I've really gotten – to be able to read subtle signs, and, and these are really almost intangible. I, I, this sounds like crazy. Um, I this sounds it. like crazy off the wall I'll talk, but like even little things, like how their skin looks to me um, as they diet down. I know that sounds really absurd, mm. but there are certain intangible qualities to how their skin looks that almost tells me they will handle it well. I know that sounds really insane, no, I, but I it's just one of those it, experience yeah. factors. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I completely um, get that because so, I, you know, little things like. Sorry, you go on, man. It's just yeah, delayed a little bit. No, no. So I, I like I said, I just um, I find it really funny because like when I say that to some people, they're like, "What are you talking about?" But you know, I can I can spot those certain qualities and how um, how grainy their skin looks, or if their skin looks a little bit softer as they diet down, and mm -hmm. I can pick out who who will really um, tolerate the big car load. And that's the importance of experience. And I was going to say before, you know, I've definitely noticed that sometimes you see things, you know, within your athletes, how they're looking. 
and you can't necessarily explain it, but you just know by feel and by intuition, like what, what they need based on, you know, your time working with them. And, you know, science can't tell you what you've seen with working with one individual, you know, especially when a lot of literature is looking at multiple individuals or it's, you know, applied studies and things like this. We, it's very hard to explain what we see as coaches for sure. I think that's where the art kind of comes yeah. in, you know, okay. there's, there's a certain art to it. And, and, uh, you know, so I, I really enjoy that. But, you know, as far as the, um, you know, grams per kilogram or grams per pound, the reason I, there's not, um, because the, I would say metabolic rate is going to be the, the number one factor level. for how large. Yeah. I've had, I've had 150 pound competitors take in 12, 1300 grams of carbohydrates. <laughs> uh, and I've had 200, 200 pound competitors take in only 800 or maybe even 700 if I'm really conservative. Mm -hmm. um, so it can just vary widely. Uh, and then also another thing that I found is very, a, a strange phenomenon. And this, this works even with a, a, a non backload peak, but it's, you know, it needs to be timed more appropriately. Some people will have what I would call a more flexible metabolic rate. Mm -hmm. So while their, their calories, their calories may get lower, um, during over the course of their contest prep so we may have bodybuilder you know bodybuilder a his calories need to come down to here bodybuilder b his calories come down to here however when i start to feed these two bodybuilders um this bodybuilder's metabolic rate seems to only uptick this much whereas this bodybuilder's metabolic rate upticks quite a bit once yeah, you start to disproportionately feed more based um, on what they originally weigh in at yeah yes yeah so, you know, that's also another thing where I get better at peaking people as it goes mm -hmm. on because sometimes, sometimes even though this person's not eating very much, once I start feeding them, um, they'll, they don't seem to fill out like other people do. And you can always tell, you can always spot these people because they're just like explaining to you as they're eating, they're absurdly hungry. They can't seem to fill up. They're hot. They're just like hot. You know, they're just like, I'm so hot right now as I'm eating all this food. And so, um, you know, it's, it's very, that's once again, the individuality is yeah. um, almost astonishing from one person to the next. So, you know, more, more flexible metabolic rate people will um, require uh, larger feedings. And once again, that even goes for the non backload people. If you're going to slowly build carbohydrates over the week, those flexible metabolic rate people can be hard to fill out because every day they seem to be like, you add food and then they lose weight and you add food and they lose weight and yeah <laughs> it's funny i've actually experienced that exact scenario with uh one of my athletes figure competitors competing this weekend so it's uh yeah perfectly <laughs> timed discussions and i wanted to know cliff have you had any horror stories with the rapid backload i have i have not luckily um <laughs> well, that's i did thing. have i did have a situation where i had somebody where I actually think their potatoes went bad, and the like, I w I had them eating a lot of potatoes, <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, and so, but that was that. I, I've never had like, like, are you talking about like where you wake up the next morning and somebody just spilled, spilled over yeah. horribly? Yeah. No, no, I've not because I usually undershoot it. Uh, if I suspect somebody can take in a thousand, I'm probably going to give them like eight hundred and fifty. Yeah, right. Um, and then then in the subsequent weeks, um, we will, you know. You know, if they're going to do other shows, we'll kind of build it up a little bit. Um, I did have one situation back in 2012 where somebody actually woke up really flat. Um, I undershot it too far. Yeah. And he was just, I know that sounds crazy, but he was just really, really flat. Like, And he was the, he was the type of person, I think we've seen it where, um, for those that aren't familiar, sometimes when somebody's flat, uh, they will just look smaller and tighter. But other times, other people, when they're flat, they almost have a softer look to mm -hmm. them. Um, some people's flat look is tighter than other people's flat look. And this is somebody that had a softer, flat look. Yeah, right. And uh, I, that was the time that distinctly I remember. Uh, for those that don't know his name, his name is Brian Alstrom. He coaches too, and he's a, he's, you know, a friend of mine. And so we woke up, and I was like, oh, man, he's so flat. And we were, we were having him just chug Gatorade that morning like he, we were just you know all the fast cars he was eating pop tarts uh just you know trying to get a lot of calories in with low stomach volume and so uh you know we were we were, luckily I would say things really started to sharpen up maybe like an hour before stage right and uh and he actually ended up winning his pro debut that day 
Um, but that was pro- that was probably the time where I had my biggest like of my coaching career, like my oh shit moment. Like we've got to fill this guy out. <laughs> <laughs> and something I wanted to ask you about in terms of you know what type of foods you use for the rapid backload. Um, obviously, carbohydrate biochemistry you know differs between fructose and glucose in terms of like muscle and liver glycogen. There's evidence showing a little bit of a trend towards. Glucose uh, repleting muscle glycogen, fructose you know repleting uh, liver glycogen, all the rest of it. Um, so, are there any specific types of foods that you use? Um, you know, do's and don'ts with what type of carbohydrates you get your athletes to consume. Yeah, you know, I, I will. I typically use similar foods for everyone's backload, just because um, it makes it easier for me to. Uh, hit the sodium and potassium numbers that I want. Mm-hmm. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing magic about these foods. You know, sometimes I get people saying, "Oh, you know, these are the foods that you know yeah. Cliff uses, <laughs> and I'm going to use it." There's nothing magic in particular. Um, but I will say that, that just for because I, I'm also really big on coaching process. Everyone talks about things making the process easier for the competitor, but I also think there's something to be said for making the process easier on the coach. I definitely. Um, so agree. for me, if I'm using if I'm using similar foods, um, it allows for a similar process, and I learn. You know, I, it becomes a more predictable process. Mm-hmm. The, the fewer variables that I'm changing from person to person, uh, the better it is for me because I can see those similarities from person to person as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, I would say some of my favorite foods I will use um, uh, some a little bit of fruit usually at the early part of the day. Uh, I like dried fruit just because it's a little more calorie filled for how much it's going to be sitting in their Less stomach. Fiber. Uh, and yeah, and, and I'll kind of use that to restock their liver glycogen, um, to start the day. Uh, at that point, usually I'll shift into some liquid carbohydrates. Uh, I'll use like, um, I'm sponsored by first form. So I'll use like first form ignition, um, which is pretty much just pure glucose. Mm-hmm. And so it, Gets gets right in there, uh, and I, I have used Gatorade as well in that situation because, like, I know that over in Australia, it's you know it's hard to get first form stuff, and even like for my clients in other countries. So I'll use um, I use Gatorade in those situations, and then I start really transitioning. Now there's a lot there's a lot of reasons why I do this, but um, typically during the deplete, I've also been depleting potassium to a significant degree. So then I switch to potassium rich foods. Um, because I sort of load potassium. Yeah. Uh, so usually a potato. Uh, this could be a sweet potato, a red potato, a white potato. Um, they're just really, really high in potassium. And if you're if you're taking in uh, a pound of potatoes, which at a meal, um, which is not uncommon in the rapid backload, I'll have people sit down and literally eat a pound of potatoes. <laughs> um, so I will do that. Um, then I start transitioning away from potassium-rich foods. Um, to usually something that is more moderate, you know, uh, in sodium and uh, a more uh, a slower digesting carbohydrate, mm-hmm. not not something particularly fast. So you know, um, or, or when I say slower, not slow, but you know, more moderate mm-hmm. um, digesting. So something like I, I do like Cheerios as a mm-hmm. food at the end of the day. Um, I think they sit well in a lot of people's stomach. The, the first couple of years I did the backload in like 2011, 2000, 2011, 2012, I was having people use um, oatmeal um, yeah. just because I was still I was still tinkering with things. I do still tinker with things to this day. Yeah. I always think no matter how, how good a process is, there's always ways to make it better. But I was having people do oatmeal and people are like, oh my God, my stomach, you know, they're like, I'm eating so much heavy <laughs> oatmeal. Um, whereas Cheerios, I think are kind of like a nice snack food. A bit lighter, yeah. And yeah, you know, they can, a lot of people can kind of just almost eat like popcorn or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, Cheerios work really well. I like rice cakes, um, to, you know, as a, as another, uh, one to put in there. So those will kind of be my main carbohydrate yeah. food as I go in there. Awesome. Awesome. And in terms of spilling over, this is something that obviously you haven't dealt with with the rubber backload, but it does happen and athletes, you know, holding too much water, looking flat, whatever the case may be. So what is your advice for someone who is spilled over? You know, if, if it happens, say, two days out, one day out, what would you recommend? Well, and I'll, I'll say this. In terms of spilling, there's a... Because I think when a lot of people think spill, they think, 
you know, massive, horrible situation. Mm-hmm. Um, now, like, even with the rapid backload, I've never had any, like, nightmare scenarios where somebody just massively spilled. Um, but, you know, I think there have been a few situations where, um, because it's always a give and a take when you're carving up. Um, you know, you can hit that point, but so, you know, somebody carves up to their appropriate level, glycogen levels are filled. Um, there are points where you can maybe go a little bit higher and you lose just a little bit of crispness. Mm. Yeah, you still look good. Um, and this is where I think um, interpretation of each person's best look comes into play. Yeah. I think there's a range, you know what I mean? Mm. Because um, everyone acts like, oh, there, you know, this is super controversial to say. So for some people, a subtle, really subtle spill may not be the worst thing mm. because of the fullness, the additional fullness that it provides. Yeah. Um, now, I know that sounds crazy, but I'm talking very <laughs> subtle. Um, the type of the type of spill that maybe wouldn't even be noticeable from the judge's table. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I think so, I would agree with that as well because like, I have one guy who's a junior competing in the juniors. He's 64 kilos. We're not gonna really. We're gonna fill him up to the appropriate glycogen levels, and then he's gonna compete later that day in the under seventy fives. And he's only sixty four kilos, so I'm gonna push yeah. things a little bit more because if we can just get him that little bit fuller and see how far we can go, like I don't think that would necessarily be a bad thing, considering he's ten kilos lighter than most of the other guys, you know? Yeah, yeah, and, and I do think some people, even if they're not necessarily, I think some people can look a little bit better flatter. So mm-hmm. like this is the hard line, you know, right here of. You know, everything below is flat yeah. and everything above is spill. I think there's a small range, people can see that, yeah. where you need to play, where you need to play with the individual variables for how that person looks. Mm. And so, um, so I guess I wanted to state that because, um, you know, there's a difference between a massive spill and maybe like, ah, eh, you know, maybe we should have just pulled that in just a little bit more because I've most definitely had those situations. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to. I'm not gonna pretend. I'm not gonna sit up here and pretend like, oh, I nail it every time. You know, I nail it every time. Um, in fact, you know, uh, you know, I think we all look back at certain peaks, and and it, it's very funny because even sometimes when I post pictures of some of my client picture, you know, some of my clients, and people just come on and they're like, oh, you absolutely nailed it. And I think in my head, I wish I would have given them, you know, 35 fewer carbs. You know, yeah. something small <laughs> like that, like. You know, then I think I would have nailed it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, now for a spill, I think subtlety, backload or not, um, is just always going to be uh, a very good thing. Because if you do spill a little bit, um, that way you could almost see it happening. And once again, it's within that subtle range mm-hmm. where, you know, if you spill, maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't your best look. You know, maybe you were a little bit happier with the way you looked the day before. Um, but it was still a very good look. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but if you if you do spill massively, um, the important thing is not to panic. Uh, I do think that then getting some activity is really good. Things like um, lightly pumping before every meal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think reducing food intake is yeah. just going to be the <laughs> biggest thing. Not not only carbohydrates, but just fats and even proteins. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, some people will just say, oh, you know, I think we're starting to spill or I'm spilled. Let's just eat more proteins and more fats. Well, that's more energy, energy. coming in. Yeah. yeah, your body is using that energy instead of the excess glucose that is spilled over. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you if you find yourself in a spill situation, um, you need to stop eating for a little while. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, it's like you need to stop eating. Um, and, and I think it's there's a real nervous aspect. Mm. You know, people just people get nerves, and then they feel this like stress to eat. Um, you know, if 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 it's Friday, and you found that you've spilled, maybe you've been bringing food up all week, and Friday comes, and you're like, I'm spill over. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with going five hours without eating. You're mm. going to be just fine if you go five hours without eating, and you'll find that you will start to use up some of that glucose. And you get a few pump sessions in there. Nothing crazy, but just light pumping to use up some of the glucose. Um, go for a walk. Yeah. You know, get some energy going. You know, nothing too taxing. It doesn't mean you want to start knocking out some hit intervals. Um, but, yeah, but, you know, go for a walk. 
Um, and I think that could also be a good thing to kind of bring stress levels down because I, I honestly I believe that sometimes when people spill, um, their their panic starts mm-hmm. to get at them. So you know, little things like that can really really clean up a spill pretty quick. Or even the morning of, if you wake up the morning of um, and you find that you are just aren't as sharp as you'd like to be, get a few pump sessions in, go for a walk, have some black coffee. Um, pick up your metabolic rate a little mm-hmm. bit, have a mild diuretic effect, you know, from the coffee to kind of maybe shed a little bit of that, get you sweating a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so little things like that can really kind of help bring bring things in. You know, you, if you're massively spilled, there's probably nothing you can do. But if you're a little bit more spilled than you'd like to be, then, you know, you bring it back in. Awesome. Awesome, man. Hopefully no, nobody out there uh, has to deal with that. <laughs> you all nail it. Um, yeah. But obviously, one of the big, one of the hardest parts of a contest prep, and every competitor will, you know, admit to this, is at the completion of their contest season, and coming out of, you know, the contest prep mentality. So, obviously, we have both the, you know, the physiology as well as the psychology that we have to, you know, start to bring back to normalcy, like you mentioned. Um, so, what is your approach to, you know, that initial phase? After a contest season's over, obviously there's advocates of the reverse diet. The three DMJ guys have the recovery diet. Like, where do you sit on that? What What's your approach? You know, do you want to just get straight back into you know building muscle, getting healthy, or do you like people to hold condition for a while before you know getting back into the off season? Yeah, you know, uh, for those that are listening that aren't familiar with the difference between like a reverse diet and a recovery diet, I just think we should maybe set a baseline. So yeah. the reverse diet is usually very very slow, methodical, bringing calories up, sometimes as little as 10 to 15 carbohydrates per week. Um, the recovery diet, I know in the early stages, looks to add a lot. Uh, I believe, you know, I, I'm friends with uh, Alberto Nunez uh, and Jeff Alberts and all those guys. They're great guys. Um, with 3DMJ and they do the recovery diet, I believe they look to maybe add about 5 to 10 pounds really fast mm. uh, in order to kind of get the body back to normal. Um, I'm going to sound really picky <laughs> when I say this. So if, if the reverse diet is this slow build and the recovery diet is that, I'm like in the middle mm-hmm. of, uh, of where that, that lies. And I know that sounds extremely picky, but um, so I do add uh, a higher amount of food initially post-show. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to take their contest diet and then just add – 15 grams of carbohydrates on top of that because they're still in a deficit at that point most likely. Yeah. Um, so I will add um, the range can just, just vary pretty widely depending on the competitor. But I add something that I know will maybe cause a little bit of weight gain. Um, but let's be realistic, that's probably a significant amount of glycogen uh, to start. But I don't focus on trying to gain weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, I focus heavily on the feel of the person and their performance. Mm-hmm. That's that's my main goal. This is where I, I think, like you said, a lot of the psychology, but then the physiology kind of get blended yep. for myself. So, because I can't say that I follow one single approach with every person. Yeah, for sure. Because for some people, post show, let's say I add post show. Let's just pretend I add 10 grams of fat and 60 carbohydrates. Now, that's probably not even enough to really even get them into a surplus. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. But when you only had 100 carbs and you're given 160, and then, (laughs) yeah, and you had 50 grams of fat and you go to 60, and I also try to get cardio out very quickly, and you reduce cardio to very low levels. Uh, even though you may not technically be in a surplus, you feel really good, especially mm. if a lot of those cars you put pre-training. Um, I think that in the early stages, people can almost build muscle without seeing a ton of weight gain mm-hmm. uh, or even see a little bit of comp just because training improves. You know, They're, They start lifting heavier poundages. and So I kind of just really play it by how they're feeling. Now, somebody then checks in the next week and tells me I'm still just really – you know, I'm still really struggling. Uh, you know, I'm feeling just pretty down. Training still pretty much, you know, crap. I will put another big addition in there. Mm-hmm. And you know, so that's why I'm 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 focusing on feel and performance. Yeah. Feel and performance. It's just that every week. You know, how are you feeling? How are you performing? How are you feeling? How are you performing? The weight the weight is considered. 
you know, mm-hmm. somebody's if somebody's gaining two pounds per week and they're still telling me they don't feel well, uh, I'm, I'm still not going to add a ton of food because I know if they keep, keep gaining two pounds per week, eventually they will feel better. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's so I, some people are just going to take time. But I'm, I use performance as my guide because if performance is improving, we're going to be building muscle. And they're typically you feeling know. better too. Yeah, yeah, you know, and yeah, it goes hand in hand. If they're feeling well, they're probably going to perform well. Mm. And if they're performing well, they're going to feel well, yeah. and we know they're building muscle. Um, but if somebody tells me that they're not seeing the strength increases come back very quickly, they still don't feel well, we're adding more. We're adding more. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the rate of gain will just kind of be what it is at that point. Awesome, awesome. And in yeah. terms of the off season, so you're obviously focusing on you know feel and performance being the you know the physical elements of the off season, but you know so often we forget about you know bringing back the things that we have to give up during a contest prep, and you know focusing on the other things in life that you know really do set us up for success in our subsequent contest preps. Um, you know, such as your mindset, lifestyle, health, all these kind of things. So how do you go about transitioning, you know, the mental side of things? That, that is a great point and something I preach to my clients that they hate, <laughs> but, but they don't, those who have done it is, um, I think that people need to, because typically I think, at least in my approach, the best contest preps are the ones that have gradually gotten more intense over time. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as a sidebar, I think I, for anyone who knows me, I'm really big on the term intensity. I think we all need to constantly gauge our intensity level and just not in just the way we live our lives. Mm. And a lot of people view their bodybuilding intensity like a light switch. I'm in my off season; my bodybuilding switches off. off. But then when contest prep starts, I flip it on and I go zero to 100 with my intensity. Um, whereas I would prefer people keep their bodybuilding intensity like a dimmer switch. Mm-hmm. Um, it's never it's never off. But as show day comes, we continually turn the knob up. And the closer you get, the more intense you become. And, uh, and so typically as show day gets closer, we do things like we don't go out to eat as much. You know, we don't estimate. There's no, you know, in the final weeks, there's no estimating. You are hitting everything 100%. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those, those types of things. Um, as calories become, as calories get lower, we need to be more discerning in our food choices to make sure that we are getting all the nutrition that we need. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't maybe work in that ice cream like we used to and things like that. So things become a little more, you know, a little more dialed in. So likewise, I like to see people gradually work things in uh, rather than trying to get it in all at once. Mm. As soon as, you know, because I don't think, let's be real, even the best of us, most seasoned competitors, we have those after effects, those mental after effects from a, from a contest season. Mm-hmm. Um, we are not mentally equipped to have too much freedom at that point. Um, I... <laughs> For myself, post show, I think I only ate one meal out in the first set, six weeks uh, after my contest mm-hmm. because mostly I knew I wasn't really ready for that. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. I think I think I would have overdone it, mm-hmm. and so I was knowing my limits. But then as I continued to return to normalcy, I can I can now in my off season I can have a meal out probably every other day and estimate my macros perfectly because I'm in a position where mentally I can make those proper choices mm. and so uh, I, I like to see people put things back in phases uh, maybe add one food that you've been really wanting to work in there don't start changing your entire meal plan mm. you know what I mean uh, maybe maybe wait a few weeks before you really start going out and est- estimating macros because you're or you're probably not ready to do so appropriately mm. um, you, can't, you can't be trusted do you want to know? Do you want to know two situations that I know are an absolute fail? Uh, when somebody tells me, <laughs> I have, I have a uh, vacation planned one week after my show. Mm. That's when I know, even if they have the best intentions yeah. to stay on track, they're not mentally 
ready to do that. I don't I don't know if I've ever had anybody successfully execute that situation. Yeah, it's uh, very common too. Then, yes, yeah, mm. uh, they're not they're not ready. You know, my wife and I were taking a trip across the country. We wanted to take a vacation uh, after my season was over, but we purposefully waited until two months after my contest season because we knew I would be more mentally ready to manage that situation yeah. properly. If I'd have done it one week, I don't think I'd have been ready. Mm. Um, and then, and then another warning sign to me is when somebody says, "When the season is over, uh, they don't want to track macros. They want to just they, they It seems so harmless in their head. Mm. You know, they they really believe this. They say, um, "I just want to be able to take a break, um, eat real lightly, but just kind of not have the stress of tracking." Intuitive that, eating. Know, <laughs> it, it, yeah, yeah. It sounds so innocent when yeah. you word it that way, you know. Oh, I, you know, I just, I, I'm not going to overdo it. I just want to, you know, I just want to be able to have the stress of not tracking. This, that, those are the famous last words of somebody <laughs> that's about to get really fat, really fast, <laughs> because because um, they quickly get into it and they realize they have no control. Yeah. Um, you know, you like we said before, um, most things that we do with our body have a pendulum effect. Um, and contest prep is extreme by nature. Mm. We have, we have shoved everything to, we've shoved the pendulum all the way to one side. Um, physically we have depleted ourselves mentally. We have exhausted ourselves. So inevitably when the show is over and we let go of that pendulum, it's going to swing back wildly the other way. And so, uh, and so we need to account for that. Even even the strongest, most uh, you know, the strongest, uh, most strong-willed people are going to have that effect, and they need to plan accordingly for it. There's some absolutely brilliant points there. I, yeah, something I experienced myself, and now do the opposite with my clients is make sure that that first you know four to six weeks after the contest, you know, we still have the restraints there with the increase in food because it's like a prisoner coming out of you know, jail, they just don't know what to do. They're going to commit crime when that's all they know, right? So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, well, um, and I, I you go, no, go. And, I, and I, you're right. I, I really think like, I think a lot of people need to almost pretend like the first four weeks after a show Still are an extension of their contest. Yeah, prep. It's, yeah, it's an extension of it. Um, you, then, you know, then as you find, po usually four weeks, people start to get it together. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? The biological drive to ovary drops, the food focus drops, like everything starts to settle down. And one of the final questions I had for you, Cliff, was, you know, fle flexibility in your training during the off season. Now, we spoke about this uh, before the show started, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, how you structure training in the off season. Obviously, the primary goal is to get jacked AF to improve our, you know, physique from season to season. And how do you go about that? Yeah. You know, that this is something I would say is probably a little bit more controversial that I do to the scientific minded, scientifically inclined individuals in the industry. Um, I don't have quite as rigid, uh, structures within my training for myself and for my clients. Uh, and it, as a side note, one thing I find very interesting is that I find that people who are usually very big proponents of flexible dieting are also very big proponents of extremely rigid training programs. And then on the opposite end, those who are really into instinctive training also then want uh, rigid diets. really yeah, rigid diet. I don't know why this, you know, um, there's this parody here. Um, but so I prefer a flexible training approach. Now I think there should be, um, with my clients, I build in constructs. Um, I advise for sets and reps and I will usually build in some mechanism of progression. Mm -hmm. um, however, I always tell my clients, these are general guidelines, not hard rules because I am not in the gym with them feeling what they feel. I'm not living their life. Um, and I think that rigid training programs ignore the fact that life impacts what we do with training. Um, maybe I have a client who didn't sleep well last night. Uh, maybe he had a fight with his wife last night. Mm. Um, maybe he you know, got into a car accident earlier in the day. Uh, these are things that are probably going to lead to him not having a great training session. Well, maybe I, a fight with his wife could make him lift more. 
<laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, these are the types of things where um, I think the stress of life can play into it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, maybe that's that day I've, I've maybe I've built into his plan, if I set up a rigid stru- structure, that today is the day, you know, for those that don't know, like RPE scales as an example, um, you know, for with a higher RPE, a rate of perceived exertion, you're supposed to push it harder. I don't typically give my clients RPE scales because maybe I have them going for high RPE uh, sets that day, but maybe that's just not going to be effective for him that day based on his life circumstance. Um, and so, or maybe he just doesn't feel it that day. I think mm-hmm. we've all had those days yeah. where we wake up. And um, so I think that ignores that. So I think him pushing it that day would probably be counterproductive. Whereas if he would, because also he's going to go in, he's going to try to push it. He's going to fail miserably, inevitably. He's going to feel bad about that. Snowballs, and yeah. Yes. Um, I would rather have them have the ability to train pretty well that day. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think a lot of, I think a lot of progress has come out of some pretty, you know, pretty moderately intense training sessions. Mm. Uh, I think that'll feel good and he'll not feel so beat down the next day and maybe he'll be able to actually just kill it the following day. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I'll even use myself as an example early on in my training career, I would like build in these really strict, uh, structures where my intensity was like set that day. And sometimes I would travel for shows and I wouldn't sleep because I would have clients. You there? I'm here. I can see you. You there? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so I would build in these, uh, you know, a really intense day and it would just happen to land on a, on a show day for clients. I wouldn't have like slept more than two hours the previous night. I was up with them, the stress of show day. And then I have to go in between the morning and the night show and try to like set a squat PR and it was just the most embarrassing attempt usually ever. Um, and I would, I would also just feel really run down when I would return mm. from, my, from my trip. Uh, and I felt like it would take me a few days to get back on track. Um, whereas now, uh, if I do have a training session that day, sometimes I'll even just say, you know what, today is not a day I should be training. Mm. Um, or if I go in, I will maybe change it up to higher reps so it's a little less physically taxing um, and I will execute a pretty good workout. But I find the moment I get back from my trip because I didn't overexert myself, I am right back on it and ready to proceed with great training sessions. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there now I will say I think beginners need more structure in mm-hmm. their plan because they don't they don't have that feel. They don't have that feel yet. But I think the more advanced you become the more flexible your training should become to um, suit what you know is probably best in that moment. Yeah, for sure. And I definitely agree with that. Auto-regulating is something that I, yes. I feel uh, a lot of uh, advanced trainees, especially if they have a good understanding of you know what they can and can't do uh, and self-awareness is a great tool. And my final question for you, Cliff, this is not one uh, you wouldn't be prepared for but I know you're a proponent of high rep curls and arm work. What's the highest number of reps you've ever performed on a curl? <laughs> uh, well, I would say 20 to 30 rep ranges are standard in my weekly training. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's for every body part, not just my, just not just my arms, but, um, uh, for arms, I do go as high as 50, uh, <laughs> at times. Yeah. But the weight is so embarrassing. You know, that, like, like that sounds cool. And I say 50 reps sets until you see me in the gym, like curling some 15, <laughs> you know, that, that it doesn't seem so badass anymore. Um, but you know, I, I really think the, the volume that you can get from high rep training is, uh, pretty severely underutilized for a lot of body parts. If, if, if people out there haven't tried, you know, 30, 40 or 50 rep sets for their arms, uh, give it a few months and work it in uh, regularly, and I, I promise you'll be pleasantly surprised. <laughs> awesome, man. Thank you for that. Well, Cliff, it's been a pleasure having you on the show, man. Really appreciate uh, the insight you've given us into contest prep, peaking, and then also those off-season recommendations for training and nutrition. Thank you again, guys. Make sure you check out Cliff. Head to his Instagram, Cliff Wilson. And check him out on YouTube and his website as well. So thanks again, Cliff, and we'll speak to you next time.
Thanks. Thanks, man.